The psychology of investing is really driven by two fundamental things, fear and greed. Humans are naturally born to be bad at investing. We are psychologically born to mimic what other people do, take our cues from what we see around us. We respond much stronger in the short term to fear than, than we do to anything else. This is why for most people, the standard advice of dollar cost average into index funds over a period of years works so well because it takes the psychology out of the equation. Brian Feraldi is a financial content creator and author who has written more than 3,000 articles covering personal finance, investing, and stocks. After spending countless hours educating himself with all of the materials he could find, Brian realized that his true purpose was to become a financial educator. The U.S. stock market is essentially a miracle wealth creation machine, especially nowadays, because you can put money into the market on a consistent basis for essentially free, and you can do it with any amount of money. That is truly a miracle, because that was literally impossible to do 20 years ago. But I believe that 99% of people out there that want to invest in the stock market should just put dollar cost average into and call it a day. Hey everyone, it's Erica. This week's episode with Brian is so good. I can't wait for you to hear it, but before we get into it, I want to offer you a challenge. More specifically, I want to invite you to my one-of-a-kind five-day challenge where I'll be sharing how you, along with thousands of others, can start investing with confidence. You're probably thinking, Erica, I've never invested, or I don't have a ton of money lying around. But that's exactly why I created this challenge for you. It doesn't matter if you have lots of money to start with or next to nothing. You'll discover easy and fun ways to start generating passive income multiply your money, and create a future of financial independence without a lot of the guesswork, complexity, or risk when it comes to investing. The challenge is right around the corner, so if you are ready to learn how to invest properly into the stock market, go secure your spot by clicking the link below. And by the way, this challenge is totally free. So click the link below or go to erica.com invest. Now let's get into this episode with Brian Feraldi. Enjoy! I'm Erica Kohlberg, and you're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast. When did you first discover investing? So I graduated from college in 2004, and I graduated with a degree in business. And despite the fact that I studied business in school, I was essentially financially illiterate when it came to personal finance and especially investing. Now, growing up, my parents did buy and sell stocks but they were not sophisticated and they did not really know what they were doing. They were buying really garbage penny stocks. So I did not have any sort of formalized or even informal training about what the stock market was, how it worked, anything like that. When I graduated from college in 2004, my dad gave me a copy of a book, very popular at the time, called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And for whatever reason, I just devoured that book in a matter of like two or three days. Uh, It was the first book I'd ever read that opened me up to concepts of like, everyone's in business for themselves. You can build wealth in one generation. The rich think differently about money than the poor do, et cetera. And that just kickstarted a love affair that continues to this day with everything related to money, personal finance, and specifically investing. Now, that book really talks about real estate investing. That's like his path to wealth. I dabbled in that a little bit, and I quickly learned that does not match my personality. The idea of renting, talking to tenants, I just was not interested in that. But I did discover the stock market through that, and I really started to self-educate myself about what the stock market is, how it worked. And the stock stock investing really was a good match for my personality and investing style. Now, I started out with very little education, so I made every mistake (laughs) that you could possibly make. If I started in 2020, I guarantee you I'd be on the meme stocks, I'd be on Reddit, I would be doing Robinhood, I would be doing all the things, all the mistakes that uh, recent investors have have made. So I just made those mistakes 15 years ago and have been educating myself ever since. And what were those mistakes that you made 15 years ago? So the the meme stocks back 15 years ago, the way that you discovered uh, stocks or uh, the kind of stocks that interested me, which is I thought investing in the stock market was buy something, that thing goes up 20% tomorrow, and then you sell it. I had no concept of there was a business connected to a stock, no concept of how to even analyze a business or do any of that. So the mistakes that I made at the time was, one, I had no idea what I was doing. 
to I didn't understand what a stock was, let alone that it was connected to an underlying business. Three, I had no idea why stocks went up and down. And because of that, I was immediately drawn to penny stocks. And specifically, penny stocks are being promoted on Yahoo Finance's discussion boards, <laughs> which were kind of like the social media for finance uh, of the day. So I bought a whole bunch of these garbage companies that were trading for like a dollar, and I was trying to sell them for like a dollar twenty. More often than not, I sold, I bought them for a dollar, sold them for sixty cents. So it was extremely painful at the time, but I was only losing like a couple hundred dollars, and I basically consider that the best tuition I've ever paid. First fundamental question that you're talking about, though, what is a stock? Can you explain to us simply? Yeah, it's it's a, it's something that many people overlook. I, I don't think that many people, even people with money in the markets, understand what the stock market is. And I think a fundamental thing you have to understand before you understand what the stock market is, is well, what is a stock? Why do stocks exist? At their core, stocks are simply record-keeping tools for figuring out who owns, how much, of a corporation. That's it. A good analogy is you think about uh, buying real estate. How do we figure out who owns real estate? The answer is there's a deed. There's a deed to a house. What is a deed? A deed is just a record keeping tool for figuring out who owns a piece of property. Exact same thing with stocks and businesses. Stocks are a record keeping tool for figuring out who owns how much of a corporation. A simple example. Let's say you and I went into business together we decided to start a coffee shop. We did some math and we figured out we needed $100,000 to start this coffee shop. You, Miss Moneybags, put up $90,000 <laughs> and I put up $10,000, okay? And to make record keeping easy, we decided to issue 100,000 shares of stock because it costs $100,000. We're gonna price each share at a dollar. We are making this up, by the way. We could do a million shares or 10 shares or any number we want, but we'll go with 100,000. So how many shares would you own? Well, you put in $90,000, so you own 90,000 shares. I put up $10,000, so I own 10,000 shares. Now, let's say our business is phenomenally successful. The next year, we make a million dollars in profit, and we want to pay profit to ourselves as dividends. Well, how much do you and I get? Well, you own 90% of the stock, or 90,000 shares, so you would get $900,000. I own 10% of the stock, so I would get $100,000 worth of that, of that stock. So that is why stocks were invented. They're record-keeping tools for figuring out who owns how much. Now, that's a very simple example. You can imagine how complex it gets, not when there's two investors, but there's tens of thousands of investors. And some investors are putting up a few hundred dollars. Other investors are putting up tens of millions of dollars. So stocks just make the record-keeping for who owns how much easy. Got it. And then the next fundamental question you proposed is, well, why do stocks go up and down? So fundamentally, the reason that stocks have value is because the assets that they represent, the companies behind those stocks, fundamentally have a value to them. Now, there's a couple of different reasons why companies have, have value, but the most important reason is that companies produce profits. Those profits belong to the owners of the company, and the owners of those companies are the shareholders. So when you own a stock, you have a legal claim on a portion of that company's profitability forever. So the reason that a stock has value is mostly derived from the fact that the business behind that stock has value. And as those profits, all things held equally, go up or down, so too does the value of the stock. Now, that's the theory behind what a stock is worth and, and why it has value at all. But you have to add on top of that the psychology of owning stocks. And if people get, generally speaking, if investors are really excited about a company and they think profits are going to grow, that causes the value of the stock to go up today. Conversely, if investors get really fearful about the future of a, of a company or the stock market, that causes them to be less enthusiastic about owning the stocks today, and that causes the price to go down. That's why stocks change in value uh, all, all the time and on a daily and minute by minute uh, basis. You have to think of the stock market kind of like an ongoing auction, right? And how, what prices are at any given time really depends on the balance between the eagerness of the buyers at that moment in time compared to the eagerness of the sellers 
at that moment in time. And big changes in sentiment, so big changes in the willingness of the buyers and sellers to transact, is what causes prices to change drastically. What is the most important thing about the psychology of investing that you want people to know? The psychology of investing is really driven by two fundamental things, uh, fear and greed. Humans are naturally born to be bad at investing. Like we are psychologically born to mimic what other people do, uh, take our cues from what we see around us. Uh, we respond much stronger in the short term to fear than, than we do to anything else. And when we see other people making money, that fills us with, with jealousy. So if it feels, if you've been investing for some time and it feels like you're doing a bad job, that's because you were born <laughs> to do a bad job as, as investing. All the innate biases that we have uh, in us make us want to invest our money at precisely the wrong time, which is when stock prices have gone up. And it makes us want to sell our investments at precisely the wrong time, which is after stocks have gone, uh, have gone down. This is why for most people, the standard advice of dollar cost average into index funds over a period of years, don't even think about it, just automate it, works so well because it takes the psychology out of the equation. Yeah, I always think about the Warren Buffett quote, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And that Buffett quote is often um, uh, very, very well known and a lot of people say it. The, the hard part about that is that's very easy to say. To actually do it in real time is incredibly difficult. And if anybody has ever looked back at the long-term returns of the stock market and you see that chart, it's incredibly obvious. Oh, I sell at the top and I buy at the bottom. What could be hard, what, what's hard about, about that? And when you look back at like, you know, 100 years of the stock investing returns, you see a trend that largely goes up and to the right. Sure, there's, there's bumps along the way, but the undeniable long-term trend of the US stock market is up and, and to the right. What people miss about trying to think about when timing, timing the market is it's incredibly easy to time the market when looking backwards. It's unbelievably challenging to time the market in real time, because what you're trying to do is essentially predict the psychology of all market participants um, in, in real time. I don't know about you, I don't know what kind of mood I'm gonna be in three hours from now, <laughs> right? Am I gonna be a good mood or am I gonna be a bad mood? Is there gonna be good news that comes along or is there gonna be bad news that comes along? I have no clue. So if I can't predict my own mood three hours from now, how on earth could I predict the psychology of all groups of investors globally uh, over any period of time? Uh, this is why uh, I believe, and many people believe, that essentially trying to time the market is, is an exercise in folly. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of research about if you try to time the market, it is not going to work in your favor, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, there's been some uh, articles that are that are written by some great bloggers um, out there. Uh, Nick Majuli comes to mind. Ben Carlson uh, comes to mind. They have wonderful blogs out there. And they've done research on uh, what would the returns be of the world's worst stock market uh, timer. So if, if you just put money into the markets at nothing but the stock market highs, and here's the key point, you didn't sell them and you held them for years, what would your returns well, if you had truly the world's worst stock market buying uh, uh, a timing, you would underperform the long-term returns of the, of the uh, S&P 500, which is about 10% annualized. Uh, however, you would still earn a positive return on your money, presuming that you didn't sell. That's the key part. Uh, you have to be able to buy, even when buying seems silly, and not sell even when your stock prices are moving in the wrong direction, which again, Sounds very easy in concept. Uh, doing it in real time is very challenging. If you've listened to some recent episodes of this podcast, you'll have heard me talk about Hostinger and their incredibly easy to use website creation services. I actually did a walkthrough to set up a website and it took me less than five minutes. So right now I'm going to take you through the basic steps and I highly recommend you give Hostinger a try. Whether you're looking to start a side hustle and need a website or you want to find a way to stand out in the job market with an online CV, they've got 
got you covered. Start by going to hostinger.com slash Erica10 and selecting your preferred package. I recommend the 12 month as you get the best deal. You go to payment and this is where you add code Erica10, E-R-I-K-A 10 for a great deal. Once you're logged in, you can claim your free domain if you want. I'm going straight to the AI builder. Enter your brand name, what type of website you're creating, and this is the important bit. Describe your site in a few keywords and be as descriptive as you can. Click create website and Hostinger's AI will generate everything your site needs. Header, footer, contact form, images, social icons. If there's anything you don't like or need, you can then use their drag and drop feature to customize the website to your liking. You can even use their AI writer to generate SEO friendly copy. But that's not all. Your website also includes an e-commerce solution so you're ready to start selling whenever you want to. Plus, you've got access to 24-7 customer support if you need it. So if you want to take your side hustle to the next level or simply build an online presence to supercharge your career, you can head to hostinger.com slash Erica10 and get an extra 10% off with code Erica10. That's hostinger.com slash Erica10. Erica is always with a K. I'll put the link in the description as well. And now back to the episode. And I want to dig into something that you said there, the annualized, that you can expect annualized returns of 10%. Talk about that because I know that gets referenced a lot. What is the history there? So if you look back at the 200-year returns of the um, S&P 500 uh, as data from, from Robert Schiller, who's kind of like the guru on this kind of thing, the math essentially shows that if you bought and held, invested in the U.S. stock market as represented by the S&P 500 and held, you earn an average annualized return of about 10% uh, per year. Now, I'd heard that statistic for years. And when I looked at the chart, I was like, where's this magical 10%? All I see is a line kind of going squiggly uh, up and down. And that 10% is even harder to conceptualize when you're looking at stock prices on any given day, because someday the market's up 1% or 2%. Other days, the market is down uh, 2%. But over the long term, the, the S&P 500 has returned about a 10% annualized return over long periods of time. Now, there's two components uh, to earning that 10% uh, return. Uh, component one, which is the biggest portion of that return, is the price of the, of the index going up um, about 7 or 8% uh, on an annualized uh, basis. So that's component one. And that's the part that most people think about when they think about investing in stocks. They think you buy low, and then you sell high, the difference between those two is your for profit. The other component that's talked about less often is the dividends that the indexes throw off uh, over a period of time. And if you look historically, that adds another, call it 2 to 4% uh, to, 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 uh, to the investor's re return. Now, to earn that 10% return, what the key part is, is you have to hold onto the index for a very long time period of time. And I think the actual time period to measure the returns of the stock market is literally measured in decades. It, it can't be measured in months. It can't be measured in years. It can't even be measured in five-year periods. If you want to earn the 10% return of the stock market, you literally have to measure your holding period in decades. And my absolute favorite statistic about the S&P 500 is that if you bought the S&P 500 and held for 20 years, you have made money 100% of the time in real terms, no matter when you bought the S&P 500, so long as you held it for 20 years. And typically I do, when I'm projecting, I'll say, okay, the S&P 500 has typically returned 10%, adjust for inflation, so 8% is a fair number to go off of. Would you agree with that, or do you do a different number? Yeah, I think that, that that's perfectly uh, fair. I think the long-term real average, if, if you will, is somewhere closer to 7%, So, but I think a fair a uh, way to think about it is somewhere between a 6% and 8% real return for the S&P 500 is, is, a, is a decent um, uh, expectation. Got it. And I want to summarize your investing philosophy. I think you already mentioned it where you're saying dollar cost average into index funds for many, many years. Is that right? Or how would you summarize your investing philosophy? Yeah. So that that's the advice that I would give to 99% of, of people out there. I think if you want to make money, uh, in the stock market, and I, I personally believe that the stock market, uh, the U.S. stock market, I guess I should be specific, is the greatest wealth creation machine ever invented. Uh, the U.S. stock market is essentially a miracle 
wealth creation machine, especially nowadays, because you can put money into the market on a consistent basis for essentially free, and you can do it with any amount of money. You can do it with like $10 a month uh, if you really want to. That is truly a miracle because that was literally impossible to do 20 years ago. We're not even talking about that long ago that you couldn't do that, that you needed actually a lot of capital uh, to put your money in, in the market. But I believe that 99% of people out there that want to invest in, in the stock market should just put dollar cost average into index funds and call it a day. So there's two components there that I want to break down so that in case people aren't familiar with those terms, they can understand it. So let's talk about dollar cost averaging first. What is that and how do you do it? Yeah, so dollar cost averaging is actually two definitions uh, of it, but we'll go with the more, more popular one. Dollar cost averaging is simply the idea of committing a fixed amount of capital to be invested in some asset on a specific recurring schedule. If you put money into a 401k, you are by definition dollar cost averaging. Uh, let's say your 401k is set up so that you invest uh, $500 each pay period and you get paid every two weeks. Well, you are investing $500 into the, the market uh, every two weeks and this is happening automatically. The reason that this works so well is that when stocks are up, you're buying. And critically importantly, when stocks are down, you're also uh, buying. So you're taking the decision-making out of the uh, equation. Now, when you're investing at higher valuations, when markets are high, your future return tends to be a little bit lower than average. And the inverse is also true. When you're investing, when markets have declined, your future return tends to be higher on average. But if you can dollar cost average and take the timing out of the equation, you are basically nearly guaranteed to earn on an aggregate basis the long-term returns of the market that you're, uh, you're investing in. As we already established, that's roughly 10% nominally, so 10% before inflation, or roughly 7% after inflation. And question for this, because I remember for my Roth IRA, for instance, I read a paper once that said, instead of dollar cost averaging over those 12 months, putting $500 or something per month, it's better if you can afford it to just lump some at the very beginning of the year. What do you think? I've also read those papers as as well, and there is a yeah there's a general debate between um, between people. It's like if you come into some money and you want to invest it, what should you do? Should you invest it all immediately, or should you dollar cost averaging over a period of time? Well, there are two correct answers to that. There's the academically correct answer, and then there's the psycho psychologically uh, correct uh, answer. So academically you are 100% uh, correct. Generally speaking, the stock market goes up more often than it goes down. Uh, so if you know that, you are better off always investing all of the money immediately because the odds of that being a higher number are higher than they uh, as being a lower number uh, in any given period of time. So academically, you, you are correct. The tricky thing is psychologically, that can be very difficult for people to do because if you put $5,000 or $6,000 in on January 1st, and at the end of the year, the markets are lower, you're gonna be kicking yourself, oh, I should have waited, oh, I would have been better off uh, dollar cost uh, averaging. So which one you choose to do really speaks more about you and your own psychology more than it does about the correct way uh, to do it. So I personally like to just recommend just dollar cost average. Don't even think about the timing of it. Uh, you're guaranteed to get the long-term returns. Um, and it, that's just like a simple way to do it, but there's no right or wrong answer. You specified the U.S. stock market. Can you explain your beliefs around this? Do you not believe in other stock markets? or? So if you look at the, the constituents of all global, uh, the total market value of all the companies that are out there, uh, the United States is the most dominant, the biggest stock market um, in, in, in the world. And if you zoom in on individual countries, uh, such, as, uh, such as Japan or, or, or smaller markets um, that, that are out there, they, they might have a different long-term track record when compared to the, to the United States stock market. Now, I have something called home country bias, which many people uh, do. You naturally want to invest in the market that you know uh, best. So if you're born in Sweden, you want to invest in Swedish stocks. If you were born in South Africa, you want to invest in South Africa stocks. I was born in the United States, so I naturally want to invest in uh, United States uh, stocks. But the United States is a uh, democracy. It's hugely influential around the world. It has the most innovative uh, and profitable companies in the history of mankind, and it's hugely diversified. Uh, moreover, if you invest 
in the S&P 500, um, those companies that are in the United States actually get a sizable portion of their revenue from, from selling to consumers outside the United States. Uh, for example, Apple. Apple gets a huge amount of its revenue from China, uh, from Europe, from South America, uh, from Africa. So just investing in Apple, you are actually literally investing uh, in consumers from around, around the world. Uh, so the reason I caveat with the United States is because that is the market that I know best, has the longest data, it's the biggest, and it's the most globally diversified. However, I think that you can get similar results uh, by just investing in total world stock market index, which includes the United States, Europe, Africa, basically every stock market around the world. But I do caveat with saying the U.S. stock market is the one I've studied the most and know the best. Okay, so now let's talk about the second part of that investing philosophy that you have, invest in index funds. Can we talk about an index fund? Generally speaking, in the United States, there are uh, three broad stock market indices that are referenced all the time in the news. I guarantee people listening have heard of them but they've probably never understood what the heck they are. So those three major uh, stock market indices in the United States are the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ Composite. If you've ever listened to the news or been to CNBC.com or Yahoo Finance, you've seen these things mentioned. I personally had heard about them for about 30 years and I always just accepted like, I don't know what that means, but it's a really important uh, thing. But I, I do think if you understand what those things are, it can really unlock and demystify uh, the stock market. So let's start with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Rewind the clock 130 years, okay, in the United States. There were publicly traded companies back then, just like there are today. And they, the way that you got information about what the stock price was and what it did was through newspapers. That was the predominant medium for exchanging information uh, at the time. So if you were an investor, you would look at the Wall Street Journal and you would find these tables of stock market quotes and it would show you what the price was, how it moved and all that kind of stuff. Well, 130 years ago, the editor of the Wall Street Journal, uh, his name was Charles Dow. Okay. And he was frustrated because he was newspaper was printing out these tables of numbers, but there was no way that he could summarize what happened in the stock market for his readers. There was like no way that he could tell a narrative because some stocks were up, some stocks were down, uh, some days a lot of stocks were down, other days a lot of stocks were up, and he had no tool for saying, here's what happened in the market this day. So he reached out to his business partner, whose name was Edward Jones, so Dow, uh, Charles Dow and Edward Jones, and the two of them came up with a pretty elegant solution. What they decided to do was to take 12 of the biggest and most, uh, most popular companies at the time, which were industrial companies, and they added up the, the share price of those 12, 12 companies. Then they divided the total that they got by 12. Now, Erica, what's it called when you add up a bunch of numbers and then divide by the total of numbers that you added up? Average. Average, <laughs> correct. So they invented the Dow Jones Industrial average. And every single day since they invented it in 1896, uh, they have reported what the, to what the average number is for, for those stocks. Suddenly, they could take this average and they could compare it to the day before and say things like the Dow Jones Industrial Average was up five points today or it was down seven points today. And they could give context to their readers to summarize what happened in, in the markets. So that was the very first uh, index, uh, if you will. An index just means a small sampling of, of, of companies uh, represent what happened in the broader market. Now, they chose 12 companies at the time because, and they chose to use the stock price because they didn't have computers back then. They were doing this calculation manually uh, by, by hand. Well, fast forward the clock about 30 years, and the Dow Jones really caught on with the markets. It became the uh, widely uh, re referenced number for how investors would talk about the markets. In the 1920s, a competitor to the, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, called Standard Statistics, they decided, hey, let's make our own index, right? And instead of using 12 companies like the Dow is, let's use 
233 companies. And instead of using the price of one stock to influence what the num number is, let's use something called the market cap. And the market cap is just the size of, of the business. It's a way of giving more weight to bigger companies and less weight to smaller companies. So they launched uh, this, this competing index over time. And fast forward uh, um, about a couple of decades, a standard statistics merged with a company called Poor's Publishing, giving birth to Standard and Poor's uh, Company. In the 1950s, uh, the Standard and Poor's Index uh, shifted from just tracking 233 companies to tracking 500 companies, giving rise to this new index that they call the S&P, or Standard and Poor's 500. So we had the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which had been reported for 130 years, the S&P 500, uh, which was a newer uh, index that was rapidly gaining popularity because it tracked five, 500 companies. Take the clock forward another 20 years, and um, a brand new way to buy and sell uh, stocks was being, uh, was being created. Uh, the National Association of Securities Dealers, the NASD, securities dealers just means buying and selling stocks and bonds, for lack of a better terms. They used computer technology to create a way to get market prices, stock prices, to uh, computer networks uh, instantaneously. Right, This was the early 1970s and computer technology was taking off. They called this new invention the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotations. Quotations meaning just like a stock price. Now, that's a mouthful, so they shortened it to NASDAQ. And this was a brand new exchange that was launched. And instead of having to buy and sell uh, pieces of paper in person with each other, you could buy or sell stocks electronically. And because they were, uh, index has existed for a, a long time, they decided to make their own index to track the companies that traded on the NASDAQ. So that gave birth to the NASDAQ composite. So that's why these three uh, indexes are referenced so, so uh, heavily in the media. Uh, indexes, by, by their very nature, are a small sampling of stocks that are meant to represent the action of a large group of stocks with a single number. If you've ever run your own business, you've probably experienced this. Everything is going well, running smoothly, and then boom. All of a sudden, things are going wrong everywhere. Manual processes are taking too long, your team is overwhelmed with the sheer volume of stuff, and your data sources are conflicting. You need efficiency and one source of truth, so you need NetSuite and these three numbers. 37,025, 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs, key performance indicators, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. There's tremendous power in having all the information in one place. If you're obsessed with efficiency like I am, then right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free at netsuite.com slash Erica. That's netsuite.com slash Erica to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash Erica. I'll put the link in the description. And can you talk about how the methodology of what stocks you'd put in that index happens and then how that changes? Like how do you get kicked out of the S&P 500, for instance? Yep. So each of the indexes that we just mentioned have their own unique criteria for inclusion and how you become a market constituent to them. Let's start with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, currently, there are 30, just 30, there are 30 companies that make up the Dow Jones Industrial um, um, Average. Now, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, one of its biggest flaws is that the dollar price of one share really influences how much weight that component has in the index. Broadly speaking, if a stock trades at $500, 
that would be have 10 times the influence as another company that traded for $50. So the dollar price of one share of stock really matters in the Dow Jones uh, industrial uh, average. So the Dow has inclusion criteria about what is the dollar price of your stock? Are you a big and important uh, company? And they do their best to represent a lot of different industries with that 30 uh, companies in there. So in the Dow Jones Industrial Average today, you'll find um, you'll find Apple, you'll find Microsoft, you'll find United Health Group, you'll find Home Depot, and uh, and companies uh, like that. Now that's the criteria for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. There's just 30 companies in there. In the S&P uh, 500, they are essentially the 500 largest, most profitable businesses uh, from from the United uh, States. Um, there is criteria about um, that you have to meet to be included. I think your market cap has to be like $5 billion or more, which sounds like a big number, but in companies' terms, it's actually pretty uh, small. So there is criteria for that. Uh, the NASDAQ uh, composite, uh, the criteria there is your stock has to be listed on the NASDAQ uh, exchange. And there are literally uh, thousands of companies that are listed on the uh, exchange. So the, each, each index has its own uh, unique criteria. And just as a concrete example on this, for example, three, four years ago, Tesla was not included in the S&P 500, right? Yeah, it, it did not qualify uh, at the time. So every, every year with the S&P uh, 500, some companies merge with other companies and they get bought out. Some companies lose market uh, relevance and they become too small, so they get kicked out. Uh, new companies come along and they gain uh, size. So every year um, there is turnover. Uh, in in uh, the S&P 500 in particular, where a handful of companies are kicked out for a variety of reasons, whenever that happens, a handful of companies are, are brought in. So yeah, prior to that, uh, Tesla was not did not meet the criteria to be included, and now it does. So if people come to you and say, okay, now I understand these different indices, which one do you want me to invest in? What do you say? So I would first say, uh, the, the first step to investing is to educate yourself. Uh, really start to understand basically the, a lot of the things that we've been, 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 been talking about which index you, you look for um, doesn't matter as much as you might might think. Each of them are offer different flavors, um, but all three of those indexes over long periods of time have produced pretty similar returns uh, for for in investors. But I would just defer to Warren Buffett uh, on this. Warren Buffett's instructions to his wife when he passes could not be could not be to his family. Excuse me, could not be simpler. He basically says, take ninety percent of the money. Put it in the S and P 500. Take 10%. Uh, put it in cash or or bonds. And I don't know how I could improve on what Warren Buffett says. So if he says the S and P 500 is the place to go, uh, I think that's great standard advice. And is that what you personally follow for your own portfolio? So what I what I personally do, uh, I I am really interested in the in the stock market. I get excited about the idea of reading through SEC filings. I like listening to investor conference calls. I like reading, uh, analyzing individual uh, businesses. So what I, I personally do is, is a hybrid approach. Uh, all of my retirement funds are in index funds for simplicity. So all of my, my 401k, my Roth IRA, et cetera, uh, and my wife's too. It's just all in index funds. It's just all dollar cost averaging. I don't even have to think about it. Uh, with my capital beyond a retirement, 100% a of that is invested in individual uh, stocks that I essentially handpick uh, for for myself. The reason I don't uh, recommend what I do for 99% of the population is because 99% of the population is not interested in doing the work necessary to research uh, individual companies and learn how to analyze companies and pick their own stocks, which is perfectly fine. Generally speaking, the people that like doing that kind of stuff tend to be weird, right? They're really interested in business and only a tiny minority of people I've found are actually interested in business enough to do the research uh, necessary, which is why my standard advice is 99% of people, dollar cost average in index funds, call it a day. If you are in that weird 1% that enjoys doing individual stock analysis, I say go for it as long as you're willing to do the work uh, required. I personally have a hybrid approach too. But I agree with you that generally for people who are not living this day in and day out and thinking about this stuff, it's not good to do that. I really think that index funds is the way to go. Absolutely. But if, if you do enjoy uh, studying business, uh, there's nothing wrong with taking a hybrid approach, like, like pick 90% of your capital, for example, put it into index funds, take the remaining 10% and buy two or three companies that, that interest you. 
nothing makes you learn faster than when you actually have money uh, mm -hmm. on the line and you're actually risking capital by investing in businesses. And you learn very fast uh, what to do and what not to do with the market when you actually have, have money on the line. So yeah, if you want to experiment and do uh, a little bit of money in individual stocks, absolutely fine. But something you said there is, I think, important to note, too, is it's very calculated. It's not like you're saying YOLO into these tense individual stocks that I really like. It's being very intentional about what percentage of your portfolio is going to, into index funds. And then what percentage, I kind of call it play money. What percentage of my portfolio I want to use as play money to pick a few individual stocks of companies that I've researched and believe in. Yeah, absolutely. I think one one thing that generally people uh, do incorrectly, the number one question to ask yourself before you make any investment is, when do I need this money back? When do I need to use this money or do I hope, plan to use this money to pay for the thing I want uh, to, to pay for? That's a step that many people just completely overlook uh, when they're making an investment and they see a stock that's popular on Instagram or CNBC or on, on Twitter. They, somebody says good things about it and they think, oh, I want to buy that too. And they, and they plow money in it. And I think that's the wrong approach. It's the natural approach that people want to take. But the first question to ask yourself is, what, when do I need that money back? And would my life change drastically if this went to zero? Yeah. Right? If, if the answer is many years from now and no, well, then you, can, you have my blessing to go ahead and experiment and buy that individual stock. But it's a really important question to ask yourself. When do I need this money? Don't overlook that question. Now we've established that for 99% of people, your philosophy is that you should dollar cost average into index funds. Next, I'm assuming people are going to ask you, okay, well, what do I invest through? What accounts are, am I opening? Yeah, this is something that uh, confuses a lot of people, especially uh, beginners. Uh, I've asked people, you know, what do you invested in before? And they've said a 401k, or they've said I have a, a Roth, and I'm like, great, so what are you invested in? And they don't know how to answer that question. They think that buying a Roth is buying an investment or buying a 401k is buying an investment. Uh, in reality, uh, the, the 401k, a 403b, a Roth IRA or an IRA, uh, which are very popular retirement uh, savings accounts uh, in, in the United States, those are a kind of account wrappers. And it's just a different designation uh, for an investment uh, brokerage account that is set up for, for simply uh, tax uh, purposes. Uh, the 401k is probably the most widely uh, known and, and most uh, invested in uh, of, of any of the wrappers. And the, the history of it is actually uh, fairly, um, fa fairly interesting. Uh, back in 1978, um, the IRS uh, Congress made some changes uh, to the tax laws uh, of the, the United States. And an eagle-eyed uh, benefits attorney, uh, his name was uh, was Ted Banna, uh, he was reading through, he was reading the fine print of, <laughs> uh, of, the, of the tax law changes, and he actually discovered that the language of the new tax law changes was um, generic enough so that you could combine um, thrift savings plans, a savings vehicle, with investing in the stock market to, to double up on the, on the tax savings. So essentially, uh, he discovered through essentially a tax loophole that you could put money pre-tax into this investment uh, vehicle. If you invested that money in the stock market, it would grow tax-free, um, and you could also put additional capital into there uh, through a profit uh, sharing. Um, so Ted Banna actually lobbied his own employer at the time to essentially create this brand new uh, tax account that was only made possible because of some tax changes in 1978. Well, the tax code that was referenced was tax code number 401-K, which is what they named uh, this tax uh, loophole. This essentially loophole uh, after. So he was the very first one to offer or create his very first 401k. And slowly over time, word spread about this tax loophole and how you could set up these new things called 401ks. And it just grew from there. And actually today, there are more than $7 trillion in assets in these 401ks, all because of this uh, benefits lawyer named Ted Banna, who kind of discovered this uh, almost, by, almost by accident. And that's the number one way that people in the United States pay for their re retirement. So it's just so funny that it was created on accident mm -hmm. uh, by Congress, and it wasn't like a grand plan that they set out to do. And can you explain the Roth IRA? 
So the, the, the Roth IRA was more, um, more on purpose uh, than the 401k. Uh, Roth uh, was, uh, was created by a senator in the United States whose last name was Roth, and he wanted to create a twist on the traditional uh, I, IRA. Uh, the idea was with a, with a Roth, you put money into a Roth account after you've paid taxes uh, on it. So you don't get a tax break when you put money in uh, to, to a Roth account. Uh, however, once the money is in a Roth account, it is protected from taxes essentially forever. So the money in a Roth account is allowed to grow tax-free. And as long as you play by the rules, which I think you have to be 59 and a half to start taking uh, money uh, out, you can withdraw money from this account also a tax-free. So it's a different tax treatment when compared to a 401k or an IR, IRA. And they can be a great choice uh, for people that are in a low tax bracket today, but expect to be in a higher tax bracket uh, in time. So if you're a younger worker and you're only paying like a 15 or 20% uh, a tax rate, it can make all the sense in the world to pay the taxes today, put that money aside, so that later in life when your income is higher and your tax rate is higher, uh, that money is protected uh, from the tax accounts. So there's lots of different ways that you can protect your money, and each of them has different benefits, but the Roth has become very popular for good reason. Do you have a preference order? So for example, if someone has $1,000 to invest, where should they start putting that money in the little wrappers? Yes, uh, totally. This would be called like the or the financial order of, of operations, uh, if if you will. Uh, yeah, I guess we should should back up and say I, I am a passionate believer in investing in in the stock market. I think it's the greatest wealth creation tool um, ever. However, I think that your personal finances are an order of magnitude more important uh, than your than your investing finances. So when we talk about when people ask me how do I invest or whatever, I say, well, that's step thirteen. Let's go to step one. Do you have a budget? Do you have an emergency fund, right? Do you have any debt that you need to pay down? So if somebody was coming to me and said, I have $1,000 to invest, I would do that order. I would say, do you have an emergency fund set up? If no, your $1,000 should be your starter uh, emergency fund. Do you have any debt that needs to be paid down? If the answer is yes, well, your $1,000 should go towards uh, paying down the debt. But assuming that all that personal finance stuff is taken care of, if you had $1,000, uh, to, uh, to, to invest. My first choice for that money would be to put it into an employer-sponsored plan, assuming the employer has a company match uh, of some kind. Uh, you should always do everything you can to get the company match, and in my opinion, no more. You should always get every free dollar available to you in, in the, an, um, a 401k and, and, and get the, maximize the company match. Uh, once you've done that, I think the next best spot to put your money is in an IRA or a Roth IRA, depending on which tax uh, bracket you are you're going after. The reason you can do that is because you have so much more control over the fees that you pay and the investment choices that, that, uh, that, you, that, you, that you have. And generally speaking, 401ks uh, limit both uh, tend to be higher cost and have worse investment choices. There are plenty of exceptions, but generally speaking, uh, that would be uh, the way to go. Once those two things uh, are taken out, I think it's up to you whether you want to invest in a taxable uh, brokerage account or you want to go off and tap top off uh, your your 401k. Uh, in a pre previously, I was a big believer in always maxing out all of your retirement accounts, but after I read the book Die with Zero. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, that no. book. It really flipped my mindset to thinking more about, no, you need to use that capital to have a better life uh, today. And I've become much more okay with spending money today to have a, a better time. So, so I would say once you've got retirement kind of taken care of, it's up to you how you want to do it. But and a, a taxable brokerage account is perfectly fine. Something that you mentioned there that I want to dig into further is the cost. And when we were talking about Warren Buffett's instructions, he doesn't just say 90% into an S&P 500 index fund. He said 90% into a low cost S&P 500 index funds. So can you talk about cost and what that means in the context of investing? Yeah, historically speaking, there's two different ways that invest that it costs investors money uh, to put money uh, in, in, into the markets. Uh, way number one is the standard way, which is just a commission. Right? If you wanted to buy or sell a security of any time, uh, you would pay a commission to the broker that was doing that transaction uh, for you. Now, investors today are spoiled. Um, it is extremely easy and common nowadays to find brokerage accounts that literally charge you zero dollars 
uh, to buy or sell securities. And no matter what you think of Robinhood, every investor owes them a debt of gratitude because they essentially drove commission prices to zero and have, have kept them there. So that is largely not existent today, at least in the, in the United States. But that's a more recent phenomenon. The second way that you uh, that it costs you money to invest is if you're investing into a mutual fund or an index fund or an exchange traded funds, uh, those have expense ratios and you are often charged a percentage of the amount of capital that you have in there on an ongoing basis. Real simple example, if you have $100,000 in a mutual fund with a 1% uh, fee, over the course of a year, you're gonna, sp you're gonna spend $1,000, 1% of that $100,000 on, uh, on an expense um, a fee. Now, Jack Bogle, the creator of the index fund, uh, created the first index fund, I think in the 1970s. And one of the big innovations that he had was really driving down the expense ratio uh, that investors paid at the time. Historically, it's been 1% or even 2% which doesn't sound like much, but if you do that math over a period of decades, it amounts to a huge amount of, of money. So nowadays, again, we're spoiled. You can easily invest in the S&P 500s and pay 0.05% uh, uh, on your money, which is essentially peanuts when compared uh, to what your cost could be. And how would people go about finding those low cost index funds? What should they be typing in as the ticker symbol? So depending on which brokerage uh, you, you have, uh, many of the major brokerage accounts have their own exchange traded funds, which have these low cost ways of investing in the stock market. Uh, so the biggest and most well known in the United States is a company called Vanguard. Um, and Vanguard has a slew of index funds that you can, uh, that you can pick from. Uh, if you want to invest in what's called the total stock market index, which is literally thousands of publicly traded uh, uh, companies, uh, the ticker symbol there is VTI. So if you type in VTI and then you buy that, you are literally investing in thousands of companies um, at one time. Uh, if you want to invest in the S&P 500, the thing that Warren Buffett recommends, I think this ticker symbol there is VOO, and that would just give you exposure to the 500 largest and most profitable companies in the United States. Now, you should be able to buy VTI and VOO at almost any brokerage, but if you're with Fidelity or if you're with Charles Schwab or if you're with one of the other major uh, brokers, they often have their own exchange traded index funds that do the exact same thing, but they might give you additional perks for using their products versus a Vanguard one. And one thing when you look up, for example, the VOO ticker symbol, that thing we talked about with costs, you'll be able to see the expense ratio. So I think for VOO, it's 0.04%. So take a look at that expense ratio. And I'd say anything above what? 0.06%, you got to kind of question. Yeah, sure. Because everything should be like 0 0.04, 0 0.05, 0 0.0. Especially if you're going with a broad-based index fund that is like the S&P 500. They're essentially generic, interchangeable products. So like any commodity, you should just pay the lowest price uh, possible. My, my kind of rule of thumb for that is anything below 0 0.10%. Uh, percent. So that is such an insignificant amount of money. It won't make or break your retirement. So if people are listening to this and thinking, okay, I feel like I can start investing, but wait a second. What if it's a bad time to start investing? Or what if it's too late for me? What if the market is about to crash? What do you say? Well, so this is why we get into the idea of dollar cost averaging being such a powerful force. Because if you look back at the history of the United States, it is basically tragedy and disaster from tragedy and disaster the entire way. There has never in history been nothing to worry about. A time when the skies were open and it was just crystal clear and it was a wonderful uh, time to invest. So the tricky thing about investing is that the best time to invest is actually when it feels like the worst time to, to, uh, to invest. Uh, over the last hundred years, there's been World War I and World War II. There's been Vietnam. There's been pandemics. There's been economic uh, recessions and uh, depressions. There's been presidential assassinations and there's been terrorist attacks. There's been plenty of worldwide global disasters that have happened. And yet, even over that time, what has the stock market done? It has consistently, consistently gone up and to the right and made people that put money into it money over long periods of time. So. It can be very challenging, especially if you're a new investor, to say, is right now the time to start investing? Again, go back to question one. When do you need the money? 
If the answer for that money is five, 10, or 20 years from now, or for retirement, the best time to start investing is always right now. And why do you think people should have faith in what you're saying that the stock market will always recover? Yeah, this is something that really confused me when I when I started um, in investing. I'd read plenty of books out there. I'd listened to uh, some big investors, and they just seemed to have this tremendous faith that the stock market would continually go up and to the right for essentially the rest of, of their lives. And they had this unshakable confidence that the markets would deliver that 10% re return. And I never understood that. Like it just never made sense to me why this thing would just magically keep going up uh, when I understood that it had gone up historically, but I, I'd always been taught as a kid, what goes up must come down. And when I first started investing or was I, when I was a new investor was, um, early experience for me was the 2008 financial crisis. And at that time, I completely understood why the market was crashing, right? We had borrowed way too much money. Uh, people were getting kicked out of their homes. People were defaulting on loans. Uh, the economy was falling apart. The unemployment rate was skyrocketing. Given that backdrop, it made sense to me why the market was falling. What I never understood was, well, why does the market always rebound? And if you look back historically, after every disaster, the market has always rebounded from that. And it never made sense to me why that is. And what I've essentially found after digging in was there's a couple of counterbalancing forces that always allow markets to recover uh, from crashes. So counterbalancing force number one, in bad times, what happens in bad times is bad businesses, the weakest businesses, the weakest industries die. Those businesses completely get uh, wiped out by the forces of, of capitalism and their customers need to go to alternative uh, sources. So in bad, bad times, um, bad businesses die off, good businesses survive, pick up market share, and that, lay, and that gives them a stronger position to thrive in the eventual upturn. So bad times cause bad businesses to disappear and good companies to get stronger. Number two, when the unemployment rate skyrockets, innovation accelerates. That's a really hard, hard concept to wrap your head around, but think about it. If you are in a good market environment, you don't have a strong incentive to try something new. You don't have a strong incentive to become an entrepreneur. When the market's going down and business and unemployment is going right up, a lot of people are laid off from their jobs and they get desperate. And desperate times really cause people to be open to trying new things, to adopting new business practices. Real simple example, what percent of companies allowed work from home in 2019? Very few. 10% maybe? <laughs> what percent of companies allowed work from home in 2020? Almost all. 80%, 90%, right? So bad times, COVID forced millions of businesses to adopt a new business practice and change how they were doing it. Would they have done that eventually if there wasn't COVID? Maybe. It would have probably taken a decade or two to get there. But bad times forced forced the adoption of new business practices, which created a brand new industry that, that came along as well as services to support that, that industry. So innovation goes up. Entrepreneurship goes up when bad times happen. And after the markets eventually bottom and the business uh, eventually uh, bottoms, those new businesses have fertile ground, a fertile opportunity to grow and bring out the next round of, of innovations. Uh, so that's, that's, that's things too. A thing three is when the business cycle is turning and markets are, are crashing, the government is aware of what's happening in the world. And the government Gen tends to jump in and provide counterbalancing support. So they provide cash payments to people uh, that have, have lost their job. They do public works uh, projects. Uh, they lower interest rate, which spurs new business um, adoption. And they generally and they generally take on more debt to get the economy uh, restarted again. So that's a natural counterbalancing force uh, that 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 comes in. 
So whenever the stock market declines, as long as government assistance is provided, as long as entrepreneurship and innovation accelerate, and as long as bad businesses die and new businesses come over, the stock market will always recover from those crashes, even if it seems impossible at the time you're living through it. Well, and going back to your point about how recessions force people to be more innovative, a lot of the great companies that we look at now were started during recessions, right? You're exactly uh, correct. If you look back to some of the biggest companies or well-known brands uh, more recently, Instagram, uh, Pinterest, Airbnb, uh, Uber, Warby Parker, uh, many of these companies were essentially a started in 2008, 2009, and 2000. Uh, uh, 10. Now, each of their individual foundings um, is a little bit unique, but that's a good example of companies being born in the wake of a great uh, recession. In fact, if you rewind the clock to 2002, uh, some of the biggest and most profitable tech companies of, of the day, PayPal, uh, Palantir, uh, Tesla, they were all started in 2002 which was 2002, 2003, which was at the end, the tail end period of the great dot-com crash um, from 2000. So that the dot-com crash wiped out a huge amount of businesses that were started uh, before that. But those companies that came in the wake uh, of that have really lasted. And they've been some of the most innovative companies of our time. I already know people are listening to this. They're inspired to start investing. What is the very first step you want them to take today? To me, the first step of investing is always the same. Step one is to educate yourself. Again, we are incredibly spoiled uh, nowadays. You can find high quality investing information on almost any social channel that you can think of. Uh, if you listen to podcasts, there are great podcasts out there that can teach you in investing. Uh, do you like to read? There are books out there. There are blogs out there that you can that you can find information uh, uh, on to teach you about uh, investing. Do you like video? You can go on YouTube. You can go on Instagram. You can go on TikTok, and you can find high quality people that will teach you information about investing in the stock market. But to me. Step one is always the same. Educate yourself and find the medium that you enjoy and find educational content on that. So if anybody is confused about anything that, I, that I've said uh, so far, I realize we're throwing a lot of information at you. Uh, I do have a free resource uh, for your, for your uh, listeners. Uh, if you go to stock investing.school. Stockinvesting.school is just like the website. Instead of .com, it's .school. Uh, I created a free uh, five-day email-based uh, course that over the course of five days will email you one investing lesson, many of which we've covered uh, on the podcast, but it also includes some charts and some graphs that kind of explain these things in more detail. I love that. And I'll put that in the show notes for everyone as well. Awesome. We have a closing tradition. The podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Brian Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away saying, Brian taught me this? So I would like people to learn that Brian taught me that the U.S. stock market is the greatest wealth creation machine ever made. And if you dollar cost average into index funds over a period of decades, you will have a huge smile on your face in retirement. If you've enjoyed the episode, please take a moment to leave a review. It really helps support what we're doing. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.